these are the headlines we're following at this hour. South Korea warns North Korea of the end of its regime in case of any nuclear attack following Pyongyang's threat over the visit of a U.S. nuclear submarine to the south. Meanwhile, the top nuclear envoys of South Korea, U.S. and Japan reaffirm stronger cooperation to cut off illicit funding for North Korea's missile programs. And for the sweet recovery from the devastating rainfall, the government vows additional financial assistance and measures to counter potential hikes in agricultural products. Good afternoon. We saw with South Korea sending its own warning against North Korea after Pyongyang threatened of a nuclear retaliation following the arrival of a U.S. nuclear-capable submarine in the South. Seoul says Pyongyang will face the end of its regime in case of such an attack. Our Lee Soo-jin starts us off. South Korea's defense ministry responded to North Korea's warning of nuclear retaliation with a warning of its own on Friday. The ministry said that just as South Korea and the U.S. made it clear during the NCG meeting, North Korea will face an immediate, overwhelming and decisive response in the event of any North Korean nuclear attack against the alliance that will result in the end of the North Korean regime. North Korea has heavily criticized the docking of the USS Kentucky, a nuclear-capable strategic submarine in South Korea, and the launch of the South Korea-U.S. nuclear consultative group as a blatant and direct nuclear threat. North Korea's Defense Minister Kang Soon-nam in a press statement released by North Korea's state-run Korea Central News Agency on Thursday called the situation the most serious stage of the U.S. planning and executing a nuclear strike against DPRK. He added that the DPRK's law on nuclear force allows them to take a necessary course of action when it is clear that a nuclear weapons attack on the country has been carried or is imminent. Kang emphasized that the deployment of strategic weapons such as the nuclear-capable submarine falls under the conditions of North Korea's nuclear doctrine that allows the use of nuclear weapons in retaliation. He also said that using military force against North Korea will lead to disastrous consequences for both South Korea and the United States. The USS Kentucky arrived in the southeastern port city of Busan on Tuesday, the first port call from a U.S. ballistic missile submarine in Korea in 40 years. On the same day, the first meeting of the South Korea-U.S. nuclear consultative group was held in Seoul. The Pentagon responded to the statement on the previous day, saying that the submarine's port call to Busan was a planned military exercise stemming from South Korean President Yoon suk yeols visit to Washington in April, emphasizing that the move was part of its commitment to extended deterrence in response to North Korea's continued nuclear threats. The port visit was also referred to as a representation of South Korea and the U.S.'s ironclad commitment to defense. The Pentagon also said that South Korea and the U.S.'s efforts to protect their citizens from North Korean nuclear threats do not violate U.N. Security Council resolutions, unlike North Korea's nuclear provocations. Lee Soo-jin, Arirang News. In the meantime, South Korea, U.S. and Japan will be ramping up their cooperation on cutting off illicit funding for Pyongyang's missile programs. Our Foreign Affairs correspondent Pei Eun-ji reports. South Korea's top nuclear envoy Kim Gun has highlighted the need to strengthen trilateral cooperation between the U.S. and Japan to cut off illicit funding for North Korea's ballistic missile and weapons programs. He said this while holding a trilateral meeting in Tokyo on Thursday afternoon with his American and Japanese counterparts, Sung Kim and Takehiro Funakoshi. Noting that Kim Jong-un has reached a dead end, Kim Gun said that at the top of their list is repatriating overseas North Korean workers and clamping down on malicious cyber activities. He also added that they will look for further action that can be taken to close the loopholes in the sanctions that are placed on North Korea, and said they're still open to talks. We will strengthen our close communication and coordination to bring North Korea back to the path to denuclearization. The U.S. nuclear envoy also said Washington remains committed to achieving denuclearization. Our security commitments to our allies and partners are ironclad and unwavering, and we will continue to take steps to demonstrate our commitment to extended deterrence. The three officials last met in person in Seoul this April. Thursday's meeting comes a day after North Korea fired two short-range ballistic missiles, 
in an apparent protest against the arrival of an American nuclear ballistic missile submarine in South Korea, with the new Seoul-Washington security dialogue taking place for the first time on Tuesday. The regime also launched a solid fuel ICBM last Wednesday. The talks also come at a sensitive time after an American service member crossed the inter-Korean border into North Korea, fleeing before being sent back home to face military discipline. Peun's Arirang News. Washington is continuing to work toward the safe return of the U.S. service member who defected to North Korea earlier this week. That is according to U.S. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller on Thursday, although he did not say whether North Korea has responded to outreach from the U.S. Miller says the White House, the U.S. State Department and the Pentagon are all working together for information on the whereabouts and well-being of Travis King. The spokesperson also declined to comment on whether North Korea had at least acknowledged receiving U.S. messages sent through available communication channels. Following explosions that damaged the Crimean Bridge in what Russia claims was a Ukrainian operation, the Kremlin has targeted the southern Ukrainian city of Odessa for three consecutive nights. Ukraine has struggled to defend against attacks blaming less advanced defense systems used in the south. Our Yi sing has more. Ukraine is struggling to defend its southern city of Odessa following three consecutive nights of attacks. According to Ukrainian Air Force, it destroyed just five of 19 cruise missiles overnight into Thursday, a far lower success rate compared to previous attacks targeting Kyiv. Ukrainian officials say it's due to less advanced defense systems operating in the southern regions of the country. The Russian Defense Ministry says these strikes were retaliation for the Ukraine's attack on the Crimean Bridge earlier this week, adding it targeted facilities linked with Ukraine's seaborne attack drones. However, Ukraine has refuted the claims, saying Moscow is targeting civilian infrastructure associated with grain exports, especially as it refused to renew its grains export agreement on Monday. Among the buildings damaged in the attack on Odessa was the Chinese consulate general. A Ukrainian foreign ministry spokesperson said it's assessing the extent of the damage and offering any assistance needed. And according to U.N. spokesperson Stefan Zuzerik, U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres has strongly condemned the sustained attack on Odessa. The spokesperson added that the attacks have consequences well beyond Ukraine, as a negative impact on global wheat and corn prices is already being seen. Meanwhile, the U.S. sanctioned more than 120 Russian and Kyrgyzstan firms on Thursday for what it said were their contributions to Russia's war on Ukraine. The U.S. State Department said the latest move would further cut off Russia's access to critical raw and manufactured materials, which financed the production of weapons. Also included in the list of those sanctioned is a North Korean who supported the Wagner Group by helping with the shipping of weapons to the mercenary group. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. As South Korea continues with its recovery efforts following the devastating rainfall, the government has vowed additional financial assistance and measures to counter potential hikes in the prices of agricultural products. Our Moon Arian has the details. The monsoon season, which has devastated the country for the past few weeks, caused significant damage to infrastructure, farmland and residential areas. Finance Minister Chu kyung ho addressed these problems and laid out a plan to support those affected at an emergency ministerial meeting on Friday. With more than 17,000 people being displaced from their homes due to heavy rain and over 2,000 still unable to return to their homes, the government will be using the budget set aside for natural disasters to fund the restoration of residential areas. Tax support for those affected will also be provided, such as a temporary extension of tax payment deadlines. Farmland was also heavily damaged in the downpours. Over 340 square kilometers of farmland was submerged in water, six times more than during last year's monsoon rain. For scale, this is the equivalent of nearly 50,000 soccer fields. The government will come up with a sufficient compensation plan as quickly as possible by evaluating the damage and actively taking suggestions from those on sites. The plan includes funding for restoration to compensate for damaged crops and equipment, as well as for livestock killed in the flooding. 
Farmers affected will also be able to claim insurance within a month of claiming for their crops and land. And as a consequence of the flooding, prices of food products such as lettuce and chicken are expected to become increasingly unstable. The government will attempt to stabilize the supply chain by funding the replantation of vegetables in greenhouses. A tariff rate quota will also be introduced for 30,000 tons of chicken by August, along with the importation of 5 million fertilized chicken eggs and funding of around 62 million US dollars to increase stocks of chicks. Furthermore, people will be able to enjoy up to 30% discounted prices for products affected by the rainfall until the supply chain has been stabilized. Moon Haryan, Arirang News. South Korea's wholesale prices dropped for the third consecutive month in June. According to the Bank of Korea on Friday, the country's production price index, an indicator for future inflation, dropped 0.2 percent from the previous month. This was largely due to a drop in prices of industrial products such as petroleum, chemicals and basic metal products, despite a rise in electricity and gas prices. The BOK says it is uncertain whether the index will keep falling as prices of agricultural products are expected to rise in July due to heavy rain as well as a slight increase in oil prices. Samsung and LG Electronics have come out on top in a U.S. home appliance satisfaction study for this year. According to global industry tracker J.D. Power on Thursday, appliances made by the South Korean electronics companies scored best in nine segments out of 12. The rankings were based on an evaluation done by over 20,000 customers who have made purchases in the past year in six categories, including brand image, pathway to purchase, and problems experienced. Samsung and LG were praised for their side-by-side -side refrigerators, microwaves, and clothes washers and dryers. In the same survey last year, the electronics firms took first place in six of the 12 segments for major home appliances. The South Korean government has named seven regions as special clusters for national advanced strategic industries to bolster chips, displays and rechargeable batteries using private investment. Our issue reports on the significance of this project. The government has designated seven regions across the country as what it calls special clusters for national advanced strategic industries to foster the growth of cutting-edge technologies and into which it will invest 614 trillion Korean won or around 483 billion U.S. dollars. The announcement was made by the Office for Government Policy Coordination after being finalized at a related committee meeting presided over by Prime Minister Han duk -su. The South Korean government will give all directional support for these special clusters to become global innovation areas with internationally overpowering production capacity. The designated clusters are Yongin and Pyeongtaek in Gyeonggi-do province, Gumi and Pohang both in Gyeongsangbuk-do province, Cheonan and Asan in Chungcheongnam-do province, Cheongju in Chungcheongbuk-do province, the Semangim coastal region in Jeollabuk-do province, and Ulsan metropolitan city. 21 regions applied for the government designation and support, but only the seven were selected, based on criteria such as the presence of innovative enterprises in the region, investment plans, and potential for growth. The clusters will focus on advancing technologies in semiconductors, displays, and rechargeable batteries, among others. The special clusters will receive, quote, a comprehensive support package, such as expedited government approvals, tax benefits, and budgetary support. Additionally, in the second half of the year, a pan-ministry council will be formed to provide a one-stop support service for the clusters. Meanwhile, the government also selected eight universities, including Seoul National and Seonggyunggwan, to advance the cutting-edge technology required by these industrial clusters. To support them, the government is going to invest 54 billion Korean won to set up interdisciplinary curriculums and recruit talented teaching professionals. These moves follow a promise made by President Yoon suk yeol at an emergency meeting on the economy back in March. The government is also looking to expand the list of universities that it will support as it seeks to foster qualified talent that industries are looking for. 
이시후 아리랑 뉴스. New social media service Threads has been grabbing headlines for its fast sign of rates. Will it be a wind of change in the social media ecosystem, or is it going to just end up being a fad? Our e d a n looks into what is behind the buzz and the prospects. We've seen one of the fastest sign-up rates for a social media app. It's Threads. While not social media, if we take ChatGPT as an example, it took two months to reach 100 million accounts. Threads reached that in less than a week. According to South Korean real-time data service WiseApp, more than one million people in South Korea signed up for Threads within five days of its launch. Threads is a text-based social network service that resembles Twitter. The app was built by the company that owns Facebook and Instagram Meta, which means users can link the two social media apps, making it very easy for the two billion Instagram users to open a Threads account. Meta even said Threads will be quote powered by Instagram. And some recent controversial decisions made by Twitter and its owner Elon Musk have triggered some users to migrate to other apps, including Threads. In March, Twitter launched a new monthly and annually paid subscription service. Users also now need to pay to have a blue verification tick. So you have to pay to use Twitter without restrictions, as it limits you to read thousand posts a day for free. This seems very timely, and I'm sure they've been working on it for quite some time. But this was a perfect timing, uh, with just the recent, the latest uh, sort of little fiasco on Twitter with uh, Musk. Rate limiting users and and all that stuff. So yeah, the timing was perfect, and so it's not too much of a surprise, um, as expected in a way. Yeah. A lawyer for Twitter, Alex Spiro, sent a letter to Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg, accusing the company of engaging in quote systematic, willful, and unlawful misappropriation of Twitter's trade secrets and other intellectual property, demanding that quote Meta take immediate steps to stop using any Twitter trade secrets or other highly confidential information. But we might want to keep an eye on whether to find out if the arrival of Threads means the end of Twitter. Threads has not been released in Europe yet due to the Digital Markets Act, which bans U.S. big tech companies from dominating the European market. But there is a high possibility, experts say, that the service will be introduced there in a very short time. However, we have already seen that some new social media services come and go rather rapidly. For instance, Apple's Clubhouse, where people could communicate in audio chat rooms, went viral in the pandemic era. But with some social media services, the novelty wears off. As for Threads, users have complained that the app drains their batteries, so it still has some things to overcome to become a major player in the market. Lee d a e h y u n Arirang News. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. We begin in Belarus as its defense ministry on Thursday confirmed that fighters from the Wagner mercenary group have begun training Belarusian special forces. The training is taking place at the Brest military range, just five kilometers from the border of NATO member Poland. The announcement comes a day after a video was released, appearing to show the mercenary group leader Yevgeny Prigozhin in Belarus. Welcoming Wagner fighters. Poland, meanwhile, has increased defenses on its side of the border since the start of July, adding over 1,000 troops. And its defense ministry says it's ready for various scenarios. Russia has called Poland's move to up its border defense aggressive and a cause for concern. Iraq on Thursday expelled the Swedish ambassador in Baghdad over a diplomatic dispute involving the burning of the Quran in Stockholm. Iraq also recalled its charge d'affaires in Sweden and suspended business with Swedish companies. Hours earlier, Iraqi protesters stormed the Swedish embassy and set its compound alight. This comes after the Swedish courts, under the right of freedom to assembly, gave permission to anti-Islam protesters on Thursday to burn the Quran for a second time outside the Iraqi embassy in Stockholm. However, protesters this time did not torch the book, but kicked and stamped on it. Protesters had previously burnt the Quran outside Stockholm's main mosque in June. Moving over to Germany, a lioness is reportedly on the loose on the outskirts of Berlin. 
Residents in nearby neighborhoods have been warned to stay in their homes. According to German authorities, an emergency call on Wednesday midnight informed them of a wild animal in the Klein Machnau neighborhood. After assessing footage taken and sent by the caller, authorities said it's likely a lion. Hunters, vets, helicopters and thermal cameras are being used in the search and police have asked that pets be brought indoors for safety. It's not known where the animal escaped from as no zoos, animal centers or circuses have reported a missing lion. And finally, martial arts fans gathered at Hong Kong's Victoria Harbour on Thursday to mark the 50th anniversary of Bruce Lee's death. Meeting in front of a statue of the martial arts master, fans paid their respects and could be seen practicing his signature moves. Born as Li Junfa in San Francisco in 1940, Li was raised in Hong Kong. He got his start as a child actor and started learning Kung Fu when he was 13. He was best known in the 1960s and 70s for his martial arts talent and for fighting racist portrayals of Asians on screen. Li died in 1973 from an allergic reaction to painkillers when he was 32. His death came just six days before the release of his most popular movie, Enter the Dragon. Matthew Ashley, Arirang News. Good afternoon. It's Jungbok today, which is supposed to be the peak of the summer heat. And to live up to its name, most of Korea is experiencing another day of blistering temperatures with heat alerts remaining in place. Please drink plenty of water and avoid being outdoors during the hottest parts of the day. And also have a small umbrella handy in case of sudden showers. There will be passing rains of 5 to 40 millimeters in most inland areas. Sunny skies are boosting UV rays to very high levels on this sweltering Jungbok day. And afternoon highs in central regions are nearing 35 degrees Celsius this afternoon. Well, weather like we are seeing today, the combination of heat and high humidity can quickly cause heat-related illness. So take care of yourself. Meanwhile, Jeju Island will see monsoon rain returning late tonight. It will rain heavily on Jeju tomorrow, then on Sunday, it looks like it will pour down all day in central parts of the country on Daeso, the last summer season term, meaning big heat. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. South Korea's rolling university applications begin in two months, and this year's early admissions fair is busier than ever, with tens of thousands of students flocking in on its first day. The boom comes after the event had been on a hiatus due to the pandemic, but more students are also seemingly betting on early admissions that don't require the reform college entrance exam, which from this year excludes the notoriously difficult killer questions. And even before the actual admissions, the packed fair already brings students into a fierce competition just to get a 10-minute consultation. This is where we end today's newscast. Thanks for watching.